So we talked last time about things that influence the force of contraction. We talked about how um, a motor unit with a large number of muscle fibers has a stronger contraction than a motor unit with fewer muscle fibers. So the larger number of muscle fibers that are recruited to an activity, the stronger the contractile force. And then the larger the muscle fiber themselves, like a person who does weight training has larger muscle fibers, not more muscle fibers, right? Okay, so we talked about muscle metabolism. Muscle metabolism is how our muscles get their energy to do their work. And the number one, the first go-to thing for metabolism for muscles is creatine phosphate. So creatine phosphate is that key molecule that we can grab a phosphate off of creatine, and where do we want to put it? Muscles need calcium and ATP to contract and to form that cross bridge. So where do we put that phosphate? We got creatine phosphate. We're going to take the phosphate off right away to make ATP. What are we adding it to? ADP, yeah, because ADP is what's left over after the muscle has contracted, right? It diffuses off. I like if you look on page 297, step number two, we have ADP. We need to make more. ATP from the ADP, so we take it, the phosphate off of creatine. And what do we need to do that? What's important? We need an enzyme to get that phosphate off of there. So we muscle cells have an enzyme called creatine phosphate to do that. So if we need really quick energy, which our muscles do, the first step of activating a muscle is grabbing creatine phosphate. So when you're you know, it's used up after 16 seconds of, of muscle contraction. So it doesn't give us a very long time for energy, but it gives us a quick source. So that's a benefit so we can navigate our world. And then after 16 seconds, we have to go to other forms, which is anaerobic respiration, where we, what's the side effect of anaerobic respiration if we don't have a lot of oxygen, but we have strong, fast muscle contraction? Yeah, lactic acid is what is the result of that activity. And then we kick into aerobic respiration, but it takes time, because remember the Krebs cycle has to run twice. We have a lot of stuff, to, a lot of enzymes to get activated, so we can get into that aerobic respiration. So it's always creatine phosphate, anaerobic respiration, then aerobic respiration in that order. So if you wanna write that on the bottom, step number one, creatine phosphate, step number two, anaerobic respiration, step number three, aerobic respiration. That's the order in which our cells use energy in terms of muscle contraction. Creatine phosphate is number one. Then we use anaerobic respiration, but that doesn't give us a lot of energy. Then we have to go to aerobic respiration. And figure 9.17917 in your textbook shows those steps. So whatever ATP is stored in the muscle, that's going to be used first, obviously. But when that ATP runs out, we have to go to creatine phosphate, and we've got to go to anaerobic respiration, and then aerobic respiration. So what is the benefit of weight training, then? The benefit of weight training is storing glucose as glycogen, so we can use glucose for quick um, ATP provision through, again, anaerobic and aerobic respiration. Okay, so talking about types of muscle contractions then, when we look at how muscles contract, we can get them to, we can, we can get a force out of a muscle without having the muscle shorten. So isometric exercises we see there's no change in length, but tension is increasing. So when I'm standing up, I'm not shortening my muscles. Or if I'm holding a book out in front of me, I'm not changing the, the length of the muscle, but I am exerting a force, right? That's isometric exercises. So when we're, because people like with joint issues, they don't recommend that you have a lot of movement. You more, you just work on tensing the muscles without moving the joint necessarily. So there's no change in length, but the tension in the muscle is increasing. Isotonic 
is you're changing the length, but the tension is constant. So what that means, if I'm lifting a weight I'm at the gym and I pick up a 20-pound weight at the gym, I can, the, the tension is 20 pounds, right? So I'm not changing the weight on the, on the, the barbell, a dumbbell, or whatever it is. Um, but I am shortening the muscle. I'm shortening when I lift the weight toward me, and I'm lengthening the muscle when I'm moving it away from me. So those are different types of force on a muscle and on the tendons and on the connective tissues. And it's really important that people exercise both types of tension on a muscle when they're doing bodybuilding because it gives you balance. We have to make sure that we're, when a person is bodybuilding, they have muscle balance, that they not only uh, work both movements of a, of a weightlifting pattern, like if you're doing a set of biceps curls, you want to make sure you're not um, going slowly on the concentric motion where you're lifting it towards you and then quickly dropping it on the eccentric motion. Because on the eccentric motion, that is equally important to building that muscle and pulling on those connective tissues and tendons. So we have to do both movements. And also you have to, not many people like it, but you got to work the tricep on the other side of the arm. Because people can be muscle bound where they have a lot of tension, you know, large muscles on the biceps pulling on the arm. But if they're not working the triceps, what's going to happen? The arm is going to start to curl inward as that muscle is bulkier and those tendons pull tighter on that large muscle. And then you see people walking around, you know, with their arms slightly bent, right? That's not proper bodybuilding. If we work the triceps, we should be more balanced, and those should be pulling the arms down also. So it's not as easy to work the triceps, and it's certainly not as fun, I can tell you that, because it's much more rewarding and feels more natural to do curls than it does to do triceps. You know, you have to push away from you, and the machines are a little different. Like sometimes they have the, the bar hanging off of the chain, and you push the bar down toward your hips while you're standing. That's one way of working the triceps. There's a number of other exercises. So concentric, you're bringing it toward you. Eccentric, you're bringing it back down again. And the muscle is lengthening, lengthening but exerting a force. And that's why they tell people that are runners, if you want to be a really strong runner, you got to go run uphill and you got to run downhill. Running downhill is what motion of those leg muscles? Concentric or eccentric when you're running down the hill? What? Eccentric, yeah, eccentric. And that can be really hard on muscles and connective tissues if the muscles are not used to exerting a force when they're lengthened. And that's when we do like the granddad bluff half marathon that they do where you start up by the flag and you run downhill. People have fried their knees. I actually know someone who had to ride the, the, the injury wagon the rest of the way because he burnt out his knees running that short little bit down granddad's bluff because his muscles were pulling on his connective tissues and they weren't strong enough and that force was going into the connective tissues and injured his knee. So both motions are important. And we actually can build muscle stronger and faster by focusing on the eccentric part of the motion. So when you're thinking if you do lift weights or you're gonna start, just think about that motion where you're going back down, really go slowly and give that its attention because you get more muscle strength faster focusing on that eccentric motion. So muscle tone is just a constant tension that muscles have for a period of time. So there's just a little bit of contraction that occurs in our muscles all the time. And we should see that. When you touch a person, when, if those of you going into nursing and you do your physical assessment, you have to feel the muscles when you're doing a head-to-toe assessment, and you have to feel it for tone. All muscles should exert a small amount of force. And they should, so when you touch a muscle, it shouldn't be flabby and no tone. We see that in people that have neuromuscular disorders. They have no tone to their muscles at all. They atrophy and have no tone. And if you look at a person that bodybuilds and you feel their bicep when it's relaxed, there's a lot of tone in the bicep, right? It holds a shape. You can see a person that's athletic and in shape that when they're just sitting there, they've got a well-developed muscle with good tone. So that is just you know, again, a little bit of contraction all the time, and that takes energy. And again, that's the resting metabolism of someone who has muscle tone. They burn more calories at rest just to maintain that little bit of contraction. So how do muscles fatigue then? If you're in a, say, a long distance run, and say a half marathon or a marathon or even a five mile, depending on your level of fitness, there's three types of fatigue that occur. Psychological fatigue is just how you feel. 
And that always hits me. I always get psychological fatigue, no matter what it, length I'm running, three miles to a half marathon. When I see that finish line, I'm like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I can't. And then people are yelling at you, come on, you can do it, come on. And I find myself walking, especially, well, not in a three mile, but in a, in a half marathon. I'm like walking that last, you know, quarter mile. I'm like, come on, you can do it, gotta start running. I'm like, leave me alone, I can't do it. <laughs> but um, that's the, the grit. Like they talk about training for a marathon. They say that if you can run 10 to 12 miles, you can do the rest on pure grit. But you've got to have that psychological attitude that I can finish this. And that's where people break down. So same thing in, in sports. Those of you that ran track, you know that those days that you're just on point and you feel, really feel fired up with your team, you can, you can go the distance, right? But if you're not feeling it, it, it can interfere with your performance. So psychological fatigue is very real. And they have done um, studies that people to, that listen to their favorite music, upbeat, like running, you know, music that they actually will outperform other people that don't listen to music because of that little psychological boost they get from the music. Um, muscular fatigue results from ATP depletion, and that's going to happen after a while. After a while, lactic acid is building up, and if you're not getting enough oxygen in because you're just not as in shape as the person who is, you know, been exercising and, and training you're gonna have that muscular fatigue. But synaptic fatigue is when you run out of acetylcholine, that's not as common. So not having that flow of neurotransmitter across the neuromuscular junction, not as common. It's more common to have muscular fatigue for people that aren't trained. So we need that ATP, and we need the ATP by having glucose, by having glycogen stores, by having creatine phosphate, and stored ATP. And training, it provides all those things. And it's amazing. I never thought I would be a long distance runner until a colleague of mine, Peggy Miller, if you're going to take microbiology, you'll have her. Or she teaches general and advanced also, not advanced, general A&P. Um, she's like, oh, you should run this long run with us. I'm like, that's crazy. I can't do that. Well, I ended up doing it little bits here and there and realized I can do this. It's pretty amazing, actually. So if you don't see yourself as a runner and you always thought you'd like to try, I can tell you from personal experience that you can do it. it just, you just have to be smart, start slow, walk, run. You know, you don't have to run the whole time to be a runner. You can be a walk runner and have the same time. Like I did the half marathon from the Onalaska Y to um, the Trimpolo Hotel. I ran it one time, I ran the whole thing, and I finished within five seconds of the previous year when I did a walk run. So you run faster when you're running when you do a walk run. So, and it's better for your joints because you do a little recovery in between your bursts of running. So I highly recommend it. Okay, um, other things. Physiological contractures, when you don't have ATP anymore, what happens? You can't contract or relax. When you run out of ATP, you're stuck in that cross bridge cycle, it, you know, the, the myosin bound to the actin head, it brought that actin inward, but now it can't, it can't let go. So you're in a state of just contracture. Rigor mortis, we already talked about. What happens is as the sarcoplasm breaks down after death, calcium leaks out. Um, it's, this says leaks into the sarcoplasm, that's wrong, it leaks out of cross that out, it leaks out of the sar sarcoplasm, attaches to the myosin heads, the cross bridges form, and they can't break down. And then it ends as those tissues break down and the proteins degrade. So it lasts about three to four hours, and it's completely done in 12 hours. So you'll know how long an animal has been dead. One time my kids were young, and one of the rabbits died in the bunny house years ago, and he did 4-H, and <laughs> my kids were like six and four. And they came to the back door knocking really hard, Mom! I'm like, the rabbit died! And they were holding it by its back legs, and it was straight out <laughs> like this. I'm like, it died! And they'd be like, right in my face. I'm like, put that away! But it was a classic rigor mortis, so it had just died probably in the last, you know, couple of hours. <laughs> and they're like, why is it so stiff? But that's just what happens. So again, um, that person in our community that said they touched their father and he was stiff, three days after he was shot was incorrect. He didn't know his A&P and got in trouble that way. So he's in jail now for a long time. 
Okay, so we have different types of muscle fibers. So we talked about, you know, we've got motor units of different size for different types of contraction, but we also have different types of muscle fibers. Some are suited for long distance and, and using a lot of oxygen over a long period of time. They can keep contracting, and others are for short bursts of energy, but they can't go for very long. So we're going to focus on the extreme ends. We're going to focus on slow oxidative and fast glycolytic. So slow oxidative, fast glycolytic fibers. So when you look at slow oxidative, slow means they contract slowly. They split ATP on the myosin head slowly. They have a high myoglobin content. This is a pigment that stores extra oxygen in the muscle cells. So muscle cells that contain myoglobin are darker in color. So if I look at this slide here, see how dark those, this is a fascicle of muscle cells. This is a bundle of muscle cells. Look at how dark that is. The opposite extreme, the fast glycolytic, they have low myoglobin content. They're really fast at splitting ATP on the myosin head. So they're good at quick responses to contraction or to stimulation by the motor neuron, but they burn out much more quickly because they don't have good oxygen storing ability. So when you think of the meat you eat in a chicken, where's the dark meat? In the legs and, one more, my other favorite part of the chicken to eat, the, la the, the, the leg, like the drumstick, and the, and the thigh. Yeah, that's the, the greasy part of the meat because there's high fat to supply a lot of activity of those legs. Chickens run all over the place, right? They can do that for hours, run, 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 right? So those are slow oxidative fibers. But where do we find the white meat? In the breast, which are the muscles that support flight. Do you see flocks of chickens migrating south? If you do, you need to get your eyes checked, right? No, we don't see that. So chickens can go up, right? Ah! and then they go back down again, and they're done. <laughs> like my sound effect. But that's how they are at our house. We have chickens, and they you know, get all upset, and then they drop. Because they burn out. Because their muscles can't support, those fast glycolytic fibers can't support that activity for very long. They can lift that big, fat chicken off the ground a couple of feet, but that's about it. But this is a cross-section of muscle, and if you look at a cross-section of a typical muscle, we are a mixture, right? So we have a mixture of fast glycolytic and uh, slow oxidative, and then this middle type, the fast oxidative. So what we can do, the good news is, is I cannot, with training, convert these muscle fibers to this kind of muscle fiber. I can't. But I can go to the middle man. I can do the in-between one. I can, with training, I can make my slow oxidative a little faster. I can do that. Or I can make my fast glycolytic a little longer for contracting. So the middle man I can convert to this one here, I can go work these and I can work these, but I cannot make this become this. They're too specialized for their activities. So what is, what's the take home point from that? Some of you are gonna be parents and coaches. You're gonna have some kids on your team that were born with more slow oxidative fibers. So they're gonna be the kid that's gonna be in cross country that just goes the two miles with no training and you're like, and they're hardly even tired at the end and you wonder how is that possible? Right? Or you're going to have the kid that does the 100-meter dash in gym class that blows everybody away, and he's a smoker and not in any sports. And you wonder, what? how is that possible? Well, he genetically has more fast glycolytic fibers. So as a parent or a coach, are you going to scream at the kid who has the slow ox, maybe a mixture of slow oxidative fibers and say, why aren't you as fast as this kid who's the smoker and non non a non-athlete? No, because you're going to know genetically some kids are driven or are predisposed, predesigned to work in a particular area of sports. And these are our Olympic athletes, right? The Olympic athletes, like people from Kenya, do you think there's a genetic component to the ability for those people from Kenya you know, to win our marathons here in the U.S., you know, running 26 miles at a five-minute mile? It's crazy, right? Some of these people from Kenya were born here in the U.S. So it doesn't mean that they were training any different than anybody else. They had the genetic tendency because they have more of what type of fiber? Slow oxidative. Because if you're running 26 miles, you, you're able to use oxygen very efficiently, right? 
or again, the people with the huge muscular legs. Take a look at the people that run the, the short distances in the Olympic track events. They have huge muscles because they have developed those fast glycolytic fibers. They can do that very quickly with a lot of strength, but they can't go very long. So again, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it looked like you were in a kind of slip, a torque trap. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that would have probably been a fast glycolytic muscle. Could that mean fast glycolytic muscle type in the trap? Well, we human beings are typically if it really can't. That was the thing that just got me when I first looked at it. Oh, up. okay. I've, I've seen incisions in yeah. legs and arms before, but it's just right. Well, I wonder if it was a wound, it was, could it be a, could it had a poor blood supply to that muscle? That's what I would guess, because human beings are pretty good at um, being a mixture of fiber types, because we, you know, we use our muscles for all different types of activities. But like, if you look at a duck, for example, do you see flocks of ducks flying long distances? Yeah, they go from like Canada down to Florida if they need to, right? So have you ever eaten duck? Anybody ever eat duck? Yeah, well, how would you describe it? Yeah, it's dark. It's greasy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Turkeys, do we see flocks of turkeys overhead? No, we don't. They're easy to hunt, right? They go up in the trees, and that's about it. They roost in the trees, but they're back on the ground again, right? So turkeys, breast meat, where, you know, where the flight muscles are, are, are white. So, okay, so... Effects of exercise then. Um, endurance exercise increases the number of capillaries serving that muscle. That's beneficial for giving oxygen to that activity, right? So if I'm running a half marathon and I've been training up to that point, I'm going to have better blood flow to my muscles than a person who hasn't been training. The more blood flow, the more oxygen, the more ATP, the longer they can contract. Mitochondria, what happens in the mitochondria that we know about that would be important for muscle? What part of metabolism occurs in the mitochondria? Do you remember? That was a long time ago now. <laughs> that was the beginning of the semester. The Krebs cycle and electron transport chain occur in the mitochondria. Remember? The cristae and the matrix of the mitochondria are where um, aerobic metabolism occurs. So for aerobic metabolism, efficient use of oxygen, we need to have lots of mitochondria. So with training, you build more mitochondria. And you, you build more myoglobin to store excess oxygen. So that those muscles are geared up to supply oxygen to that working muscle because endurance exercise requires lots of oxygen. The typical marathon runner does not run a five-minute mile. That's an extreme case. Because if I look at the difference, here's a mar this is the typical marathon runner, which they say actually is this healthy. Does that guy look like a healthy guy? He's extremely thin, right? Very little body fat, but his muscles are very efficient. Look at this guy. This is a Olympic track runner. He is doing resistance training. He does high intensity speed workouts to prepare for his event. And look at the size of those muscles. So also increasing capillaries, mitochondria, but also more myofilaments, more myofibrils. So what does that mean to the muscle cell? What does more myofilaments and myofibrils do to the muscle cell? Makes it bigger, right? We call that hypertrophy, making the muscle cell bigger. So that's why resistance training is going to build up that muscle. And again, if you build up your muscle, those, those muscles, that muscle is more metabolic and you burn more calories. And that's why people are really talking, switching to this high intensity training. Have you heard about HIT, ex, or HIT training, right? High intensity exercise where you don't have to run for three hours, like, you know, or four hours in a marathon, you know, to be in really good shape. You can do 10 to 15 minutes of high intensity exercise and that's all your workout has to be. There are people that are in excellent shape that don't work out more than 15 minutes a day. And do we have 15 minutes in our day? Probably. I've sat and goofed around on my phone for 15 minutes, you know, I could have got a good workout in. So there's really no excuses for not being in shape as a society. It's just motivation and priority, you know, prioritizing, right? 
um and knowing what to do. some people don't know what to do. and that's why you know you get online, look at youtube, they'll get lots of advice on high intensity training. and i can't tell you how much exercise helps college students regardless of your age. when you are exercising you have better blood flow it, you have better ability to handle stress because they have done research studies and saying that exercise alone can replace medication in people with mild to moderate depression or anxiety. Exercise alone. I've noticed it myself. I've been in a crabby mood at the end of the day. I've had a lot of stuff going on. I take the kids to the Y and I'm you know, go work out and they're whining, complaining. They're in a bad mood too and we're just at the end of the day. We go exercise. We all get together. We're happy. We're singing in the car and I'm just in a great mood. And I can feel that neurotransmitter release in my own perspective. It's all of a sudden the problems of the day are not that big of a deal anymore after I've exercised. Or even just be really stressed out some, not be, but if you're really stressed out sometime, get on a treadmill or a bike and try to feel how stressed you are as you're doing that activity. You'll find that you're just not as stressed when you're exercising. So exercise can really help us when you're sitting around studying a lot, right? Because what happens, you sit around, you study, you stare at a book, you're working on a paper, and you lay down, to, and your eyes are tired, right? You're mentally fatigued, and you lay down, and you can't sleep. And you stare at the ceiling, oh, what the heck? I'm so tired, I need to sleep. I gotta be in good shape for my test tomorrow, but you can't sleep. That's because physically, your body is not tired because you've been sitting all day. So a little bit of exercise can fatigue your body, help your brain cope with stress, and it's a win-win all the way around. So I highly recommend it. One thing I recommend to students do is walk fast to class. Don't just plod along with your coffee cup, right? Try walking fast to class and taking the stairs to class. There's a little high intensity training right there. So think about that. We're on the fourth floor, take the stairs. Or if you're at work, take the stairs. <coughs> at Gunderson, I work on the sixth floor. What floor are you on? Three. Um, there's staircases, you can avoid those elevators and, and take the stairs up. So you might be a little sweaty for about 10 minutes into your shift, but it goes away and you burn some energy. So effects of aging on skeletal muscle, reduced muscle mass. So your little old ladies and men in the nursing home, they don't have a lot of muscle anymore, right? So when you try to do those flu shots, you gotta be careful you're not hitting the bone because their deltoid is what gets the flu shot. You wanna make sure you're pumping up that little bit of muscle that's there, kind of squeezing it and giving yourself something to give that injection to. I've seen people go straight in with no squeezing up of that muscle and not good. Um, it takes longer for the muscle to contract in response to that neuromuscular junction. So you have the motor neuron stimulating the muscle, right? So you're walking along, you're a little lady, and you, the cat is suddenly in front of you and you're like, oh, and you want to move your position, right? Because you don't want to trip over the cat. But if the neuromuscular junction is not as fast, what happens? They can't adjust their feet like you would. Like how many times you would trip like seriously over IV tubing or a cord at work and you'd catch yourself right away, right? Older people can't do that. So they don't have the response time anymore, so they fall. So we have to make sure that our hospital rooms, our nursing home rooms, family, friends that you're maybe caring for, or yourself if you have like, you know, an injury when you're older, Make sure that the walkways are clear because the response time is not what it used to be. And that's also in events, you know, where we have a response time. The older people are always going to have a slower response than the younger people. It's just the way we age. We can't help that. So that's why we have age categories for athletic events. Reduced stamina. We just can't go the distance anymore because our muscle fibers fatigue. We run out of ATP. It takes longer for our muscles to recover. So when a person gets up to go to the bathroom, an 85-year-old gets up to go to the bathroom, they sit down, it's going to take them longer. They're going to be deep breathing longer than a younger patient to recover from that muscle exercise. And that's where if someone has really crappy lungs, we really have to be careful. I've seen people die on our floor that had really bad lungs and they were on a full face mask and getting lots of oxygen and pulling CO2 out, it's called the BiPAP machine, and they get better. So we take them off the BiPAP machine and we put them on a high flow nasal cannula and they get better and we put them on the regular nasal cannula and things are going better, but we push them too much and they say, well, I think I'd like to go walk to the bathroom. Now that I'm better, I'm on the nasal cannula and I was using the commode. Well, first I was, they were using a bedpan or maybe they had a catheter in even. Now they're using the commode well, now, because they're getting better, now they're on the little nasal cannula and they're going to walk to the bathroom now. And we want to encourage our patients to keep healing, right? 
But if we're not careful, if we see someone who's dropping in their oxygen levels, they're not, those muscles are using oxygen. So the more they walk, the more muscle activity they're using. And if they are not in great shape, if they're a little old lady with bad lungs, we can kill them by pushing them too far. And we've had patients that have gone to the bathroom and went into respiratory arrest on the toilet and died because we didn't get to them soon enough and they passed away from it. So again, knowing your A&P and understanding that little old ladies with bad lungs and weak muscles, they're gonna have increased recovery time and they're gonna be huffing and puffing with exercise. So we have to be careful and say, you know, let's just use the commode. We just switched you to the nasal cannula. We don't wanna push you too far. Let's just see how you do on the commode. And, you know, put an oxygen sensor when they're on the commode and see how they're doing. If they're dropping down on the commode, then we definitely don't want them walking to the bathroom, right? Because that's more work. Right, so yes. Exactly, right. And yeah, the heart attacks, a respi or heart stoppage, um, arrhythmias where their heart beats a funny beat, and respiratory arrest happens in the bathroom. So we have to really be careful. And on our floor, we have to sit with every person in the bathroom, no matter what. And we struggle with that, right? Because some people don't need that, we don't think. But again, if they drop over with an arrhythmia, it's too late because they've already cracked their head you know, hitting the, the shower or something on the way down. So we really have to be aware of our patients. And then decreased density of capillaries. Well, obviously, if you don't work a muscle, it's going to atrophy. Because what do muscles need to contract? What has to bind to troponin? Calcium. And smooth muscle is an important muscle, right? So we need that for our blood pressure. Cardiac muscle is a muscle. It needs calcium to do its contracting. If you're gonna prioritize, if you're running this body, which would you prioritize? If there's calcium floating through the system, where are you gonna put it? Into a muscle that's not being used? Or are you gonna put it into the heart muscle that's being used every second? You're gonna reserve it for heart muscle function, right? So if we don't use our muscles, if it's again, the phrase is, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you sit around and you're sick for a couple of days and you're really laying in bed, you'll notice, gosh, coming up the steps, I'm really out of breath after being sick last week. Our muscles atrophy very quickly. And that's the bummer too, right? If you exercise you, and you get busy and you miss a week of exercising, you get back to it and it's like, oh, this is harder. But it's only a couple of days and you're back at it. Our muscles do have a good memory, which is good. So once you get going, you can get back into exercising. So if some of you have been really athletic just a couple of years ago, if you pick it back up, you'll be surprised. You'll be quicker than someone who's never exercised because you have a, a foundation that you're building on. Um, but our patients, if we let them sit in bed all day or sit in the chair all day, and I was thinking about a shift I worked recently. It was a night shift, and my patient sat in the chair from 6 p.m. when I 6:30 p.m. when I got there until 7 a.m. when I left. Never got up from the chair. I'm thinking, you know what? I probably should have got him up a couple of times because he discharged the next day, and you know he just sat and sat and sat and sat and sat, and that's not good for getting them strong. That's why they have to go to physical therapy. You're not allowed to say, oh, I'm going to skip physical therapy. I'm not feeling well today. Well, okay, then you can do physical therapy in the nursing home. And they don't like to hear that, but it's the reality. We can't keep people because they don't want to participate in physical therapy. If they're too weak to go home and they're, uh, they're medically stable, they have to go to a nursing home because it's cheaper there. Insurance won't pay for a hospital stay. They'll pay for a nursing home. Yes. I used to work in a nursing home, and uh, there was a patient who was 130. Wow. Yeah, 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 103. 103 years old. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's the difference? And that's my question. And I always finish this lecture on what's the difference between the little old lady that needs an assistive two going from the bed to the wheelchair at 85 and your 104 year old resident who walks the halls freely with no assistance? What? So you look at this list here of effects of aging. What slows all of this? What's the buzzword for the whole semester? Exercise, exercise. If you ask, look in the chart or ask a, an old person, gosh, you're in great shape, what is it? Well, I did this, I was a farmer, I helped my husband on the farm. Or one lady, I think I told you before, she worked at a, at a butcher shop and she was carrying you know, meat back and forth from the fridge back to the counter and back and forth. So the more active we are, 
the better the quality of life we're going to have when we're older. So if you right now look at yourself and you're a sedentary person that gets no exercise, you're going to get weaker and weaker and weaker as you age. So you want to build the foundation now so you go into those older years with some strength. I have a relative right now that gets no exercise. She sits. She's a unit secretary. And she sits and she sits and she sits. And she said, oh, I got really scared. She's in her early 60s. She said, I got really scared. We were sitting down at a, at a brewer game on the grass, and I couldn't get up. I couldn't get off the grass. I had to have two people get underneath my arms and help me stand up. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that's the effects of aging with no exercise and a sedentary job. You're not working your muscles, and you will lose the ability to be mobile as an older person. So if you want to avoid that kind of life in the future, we've got, to be, we've got to be fit. Being thin is not the only thing we should look for in society, because society just focuses on thin, right? Oh, you're so thin, you're so healthy. Not necessarily. There's many thin people that are very weak, and they have a weak heart also. So it's important that we exercise. And we're going to get into our next system, which is the cardiovascular system. Again, an important muscle, the heart muscle. And talk about the importance not only of just strengthening our muscles, but cardiovascular exercise is important as well. But we'll pick up with that in the next.